May all that I say and all the chizik that we gain bring nachad ruach to Hashem Barach, serve as a schut for Klal Yisrael, and invoke rachamei shemayim for everyone in need of Yeshuot. Amen. Amen. And welcome everyone. Welcome our viewers on TorahAnytime.com. Uh, tonight's shiur, Bezlat Hashem, may it serve as a schut for the refuah shlema of my dear father, Avi Mori Raphael Ben Estel. Um, for Sofa Bat Mazatov, Rufu Shlema, and Michal Bat Yochevet. Rufu Shlema amongst all of Kla Yisrael. Amen. Amen. Only see good, good, good things. Be'ezrat Hashem. Today I feel like really feel like I merited Mamash Mechayeh um, Metim. My father was no less than being taken away from the world and Baruch Hashem have the schut of having him back with us and he's recovering and it's uh, gave me a lot of emuna, gave me a lot of emuna and a lot of simcha and I'm just thankful. Thank you Hashem. Thank you Hashem. Really. Okay, so today we're going to talk about, hi, so glad to see you come. Um, the Esther Haman Mordechai and Achashverosh in all of us. Um, so I'm going to try to sort of bounce off still on the emotional aspect of uh, trying to work on our internal emotional wellness and tie it into the story of Purim and see really the characters of our lives can be found in these four characters. And uh, I'd like for it to be an open conversation. I really do. I feel like this sort of topic is, I'd love to hear you know your opinion, so stop me at any point. I want it to be sort of like this open conversation about what you feel about what I'm spitting out there and, and, and uh, how you relate to what you know we're going to be learning tonight. Purim, in essence, if you look at it, it really is the story of our lives. Because here we are, we drift away from Hashem. Hashem sends us a wake-up call, and then, God willing, we come back, and then we merit the Yeshua. And that's really what Purim is. And, and, and it all is done in hiddenness. It's all done in concealment. And, and the beauty of it is that really everything that we learn in the Torah, everything could be applied to today's world. Everything could be applied to our personal lives. And so it's, it's a wonderful thing that we can look at the Torah, and I always say, you know, Torah has no expiration date. There's no clauses attached to the Torah. It's not that it says, okay, Torah is applicable only when, you know, up until such and such time, or, you know, if this happens, you don't have to apply. No, it, Torah is indefinite. It's eternal. It has, it's not, it's not a variable. And so to see it in actuality, to actually be able to look at the story and say, wow, that pertains to me. Um, tonight we're gonna see that uh, quite clearly. Um, so, what we need to understand from the Purim story is that that is the essence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He sends us wake-up calls. Now, we can look at suffering on various angles. We could see suffering, of course, as cleansing and a punishment, but the way that I feel that encompasses it all and sort of gets us also to move to the places where we need to move is if we look at it as a wake-up call. That suffering, challenges, hardships, troubles, uncertainties, confusion, darkness, one and the same, they're all really meant to wake us up. And um, I don't know if I've said this before, but I'll say it here. Hashem always starts with a caress. Wake up, my, my child. You're sleeping. You need to get up. The time has come. The bus is arriving. Wake yourself up. We don't understand it. Hashem begins to shake the blankets. Come on, time to wake up now. Bus is coming. Can, can you see? Look at the clock. Still not waking up. And now Hashem is pulling off the covers and He's throwing water on our faces and sending us all these harsher, stronger, louder messages. Depending on how asleep we are, that's going to be the degree to which we're woken up. If we're very softly asleep, napping, just dozing off temporarily, then the wake-up calls won't be so strong, God willing, and we'll be able to understand the messages if we're alert and awake and in tune and in connected to Kaddish Baruch Hu throughout my entire life, every day I see Hashem, I know Hashem, I feel His presence, then He won't have to really make it so clear to me that he is in my life and that he's running the show and that I need to recognize that, you know, 
I have really no control over what's going on and I need to, to, to shift myself because I've drifted off from my path. So wake up calls, when we're now here in this generation where it's all about shunning responsibility, this whole generation is about, it's not my fault, I'm a victim. It's their fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my neighbor's fault. It's because of the background that I grew up with. It's because I married the husband that I did. It's because I have these type of children. It's because I have no money. We're always placing this blame. And I heard an amazing shear the other day by Rob Rieti. And he said, the worst thing that we could do is go on the ABCDEs of shunning responsibility. What are the ABCDEs? I said this in the Daily Dose of Amuna. A, accusing. B, blaming, C, complaining, D, denying, E, making excuses. That's shunning responsibility. And the number one thing that we do in this generation, all of us, every single one of us, some more, some less, as we're younger we do it more, as we're older we do it maybe a little bit less, but we are always blaming and, and placing our responsibility on other people. And it's their fault, and it's that fault, and if only, and if it would be, and could be, and should be, everything would be different. But we can't. We have to assume responsibility. We have to understand that the Jewish people were sent Haman because they drifted from the path. Every time, and we see this over and over and over again, that the way Hashem speaks to us is when we drift off, Hashem sends us a Haman or an Achashverosh, or something along those lines. And we have our version, our modern day version, unfortunately, of Haman today. So when we look at the wake up call, we have to say, yeah, it doesn't look like it's the sign and the caress of a loving father, but we'll do anything to save our child when they cross in the street and a car is, God forbid, going to you know, cross their path and hit them and hurt them. We're going to do anything to save that child. So if we look at it from that perspective, I'm asleep and I'm almost going to walk into a wall and someone's trying to wake me up, so I'll get pain here for a moment, but it's going to stop me from getting a concussion on my head, so it's the better of the, of the worst. And so that's how we have to view life, is that these wake-up calls are here for the better good. And they're all, again, if it could be it was in this lifetime I did something, you know, that, need, that I need to be waking up from. It could be something in my past lifetime that I'm here, you know, to, to fix and to correct. And so that's why Hashem is waking me up. Whatever the case may be, again, it's seeing my smallness in compared to Hashem's greatness. Imuna demands a tremendous amount of humility. I cannot have Imuna in Hashem if I think of myself as being big and in charge and in control. I have to know where is my place in the scheme of creation. Hashem knows better. And that takes a tremendous amount of humility. If I can practice humility in my own home with my husband, if I could practice humility with my children as being a parent, in other words, again, I'm not here to say don't teach your children to be respectful. Don't, I'm not say, saying don't you know, reprimand your child if they're being chutzpah. But I'm, I need to understand that if I'm getting you know, hurt by them, if I'm getting humiliated by my spouse, by my child, by my in-laws, by my neighbor, I should be humble enough to understand that I'm deserving of it. I did something wrong and it's a wake-up call for me. I should understand and be in that humbled place and understand. I find from, I've been on a tremendous journey in the last few years, Baruch Hashem, and I just find like every means that I've had to correct, like at the basis of everything is the humility. Like it's, it's the foundation, just, just, it's funny that you're saying Amuna, because Amuna is the foundation, but and, and humility is cost. I mean, you pick any need the arrogant, I mean, you know, right. if it's at the bottom, is without the humility, you can't even... Now, understanding that I'm deserving of whatever it is that's going on in my life. And not only am I deserving, that's the, one, that's the foundation of it that I'm deserving. And Tzadik Hashem Bekol Drachav, Hashem is 100% just in all his ways. But if you want to go one step further, I can go outside of it and say, not only am I deserving, but it's good. It's good for me. It's serving a better purpose. I mean, that's going one step further. Again, that's the journey of life to get to that point, right? First, it's acceptance. Then it's acceptance with love, and then it's acceptance with joy.
those are the three steps. But I mean, if you have like an abuse situation, I don't think any woman can say, I deserve this abuse. Okay, I'm not, you can't talk to, again, this I'm talking to all of us, hopefully none of us are in that painful situation. Again, you can't talk logic when a person's in pain. I'm saying that we're all here now, hopefully none of us are in that emotional turmoil, even if we left it at home. But right now, as we're sitting here at nine o'clock at night, we're not in that turmoil. So we could talk a little bit of logic, but certainly, we have to understand that Hashem makes no mistakes. If, if, if a woman is involved in an abusive place, or anybody, and a woman, whatever, a child, even, there is some sort of justice there. Again, I'm not here to, I'm not, I, I can't defend or, or, or explain it better. That's where humility comes in. I'm humbled enough to say I don't understand, but I trust Hashem. And I know that there is a bigger plan. And if he put me or her or them or whatever in that situation, there's a service of better good here. There's something good going on here. I just don't but see it. It's also dust, though, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. I mean, the trust, but it's the trust in Hashem does not necessarily mean they should stay. I didn't say that, no. Yeah, I'm just, I'm and I'm I, oh, I'm sorry. I am 100% glad that you're clarifying. Uh, but you know why I didn't clarify? It's because I'm hoping that some people have already followed up on my past year women. I've said that. Me this subject comes up very often at this table. This table will come and testify that that subject comes a lot. I'm being asked this from various times, various people. What, what do you mean, a woman in an abusive situation? We're always going back to say, no, I'm not saying, you know, sit there and accept the, uh, right, there's da Torah, as as a right, but, but don't get angry at Hashem because you're in that situation is what I'm trying to say. Don't get angry with Hashem. Somehow or another, this is, you, we don't see the good right now. Somehow or another, my child is off the derech. Somehow or another, it's gonna be good. There's gonna be a better good. There's, it's gonna happen. I have to hold on to it. I'm 35 years old and I'm not, somehow, I'm not supposed to be married when I'm 35. It'll happen, and when I'm, when I'm ready to be married, when the husband is nice and stewed and cooked great on that stove top, and I got the, it's just like perfect stew, it's the perfect consistency, and everything's blended together, it's gonna be perfect for me, and, and it was kidai, and it was good for me to wait all along. That's where the humility comes in, is accepting that, accepting that those wake-up calls are there to, to bring me to a better place, to a better path. And that was, the, and we're going to talk about this, as well was one of the problems that the, that the Jews back then, that, we, that they didn't do, they shunned their responsibility. Um, you know, we'll talk about that soon. So let's look at a chashverosh. Chashverosh, if we take the word, we'll see achrosh. Achrosh. He thought he was the bigger brother, the head brother of the world. He was basically in charge of the entire world, right? From, from Hodu, Hod, the majesty, the greatest, beautiful, elated place of the world, to Kush, the lowest of the lowest. He was in charge of everything. He was so full of himself. But he was so full of himself, but yet it was all delusional. It was all madness. Because if he was so feeling so powerful within himself, why did he have to show off Vashti and why did he have to kill her in order to show his power, like if you defy my power, I'm gonna kill you. That's all a show. Anytime we see, I always say, if I only knew this when I was a young teenager, I always say, say to my kids, if I only knew the lessons today that, that at 44 that I knew when I was you know, 16, 17, I wouldn't have gotten angry at that girl who was so snobby in my 10th grade class who was making me feel horrible. If I only knew, I would realize she's someone who goes to bed at night feeling horrible, feeling miserable, and that's why she works so snobby and stuck up in front of everybody in the class. If I only knew that that was the real truth, I didn't know. The bottom line is when you see that personality of showing off, of being brazen, of being in your face, it's only a cover-up to show that that person lacks exactly that. It's very interesting, but I know someone who is obsessive-compulsive when it comes to cleaning. Cleaning, like really, like beyond like cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. And, and I heard once before, and it's so true, that what you display on the outside is exactly what you're missing on the inside. If I'm cleaning obsessively my house, that means I feel dirty than in the inside. I'm trying to clean everything on the outside because I feel that's the only control I have. Does it work in the opposite? 
opposite? It, and it works exactly in the opposite. Yeah, you can tell that's in the house. Yeah, right? Why? They're very clean? I have a tremendously messy oh. house. I have that. <laughs> yeah. Very limited. You're very clean inside. Really? No, it could be. It could be. It could be that inside you feel like you have so much control that you don't feel like you I have to like manifest it on is, the outside. It always existed, but now I put it in, in its place. I'm very spiritual now, mm. and I feel like not that one negates the other, but meaning like, like, aren't you going to feel silly when you get to Om Haba that this is what was. Not important, you know what I'm saying? The spiritual is important to my husband as well, but I'm right. just saying, like, I don't know, it's so gosh weird to me. Not that I shouldn't try, I do try every day, I'm just right. really limited, but right. I'm not limited spiritually. Like, I feel like my world, whatever limitations I have, it's really in this physical right. world. Well, the only reason that I would say that, that a, a woman should ensure that her house is in an orderly fashion, like, I know I, the best compliment I get from my husband is when he opens up the joint and he says, uh, he'll ask me where's something, and I'll be, it's on the left in the back, and he'll go and he'll be like, wow, how'd no, you know that? that? I know, but I how did know you know that? that? Oh, really? And, and he's so proud. He's like, wow, what an Eshet Chayel I have. Like, he's so proud of that. So the only reason why I would say that a woman should keep, you know, the basic, again, I'm not talking SED, I'm saying, is because it really does give Yeshuvah Dat. It's very important. Yeshuvah Dat is when you see everything in its right proper place, it settles your mind. It really does. When you know the, you know, more or less everything, again, not, that what, I think I said this before, you know, if your house looks like a pharmacy, your kids will need medication. I think that was the, the <laughs> saying. But it's just true. You don't want to bring up your kids in a museum. You know, you don't want them to have, but, but everything should be in its clean and proper place. But everything is a sign for us. Again, we could be our own healers. We can heal our own you know, essence, if we just are just aware of ourselves and we take the time and the courage to sit down with ourselves, which is what we've been learning the past couple of weeks, to sit down and say, these are my issues. Wow, that's where we stop blaming. That's where I assume responsibility. Because if I understand that the only person that I'm here in this world to change is me. I'm not here to change anybody else in this world. So I can't blame anybody and, and shun responsibility on anybody else. I'm not here to change my husband. If I change, then he's relating to someone else and that's gonna change him. So it's by default that he's gonna change and my kids are gonna change. But I'm not here to change anything. The worst thing you could do is, is start lecturing your husband and telling him this is what you should be doing or could be doing. It's the worst thing. You want to make your husband daven better? You want him to grow in your rachamayim? You, you display your rachamayim. Take upon yourself more tzniyas. Daven in front of him. Daven, you know, say the brachas out loud. Whatever it is. Exaggerate your actions. Display it on the outside. And it will eventually rub off when the time is right. That with davening, example plus davening, is the only hishtadlus that we have today. That's the only hishtadlus that really means anything in this world today. Um, so Hashverosh was delusional. That's the, the, the Hashverosh, the delusional part is that part of us. Us being delusional, thinking that we're all powerful, thinking that we're all in control, thinking that we control all the aspects, the hood, the majesty, and the kush, the lowliness of my. I don't control that. Being spiritual, being majestic, being uh, on this royal spiritual plane, that's a gift from Shemaim. It's something I have to daven for. We said this before, when it comes to spiritual pursuits, there's no end to one's hishtadlus. We have to try and to yearn and to daven and to do as much hishtadlus, take upon ourselves whatever we can that we feel we can, yes, um, manage in our lives that's realistic for us to take upon ourselves. But there's no end. There's no end. But it's a gift from Shemaim. He has a lot of, you have people who, who want so badly to grow closer to Hashem and they just can't. There's so much husks, so much impurities surrounding them. They just can't. It's a gift. It's a gift from Shemaim. So that's, I really don't control anything. And this was one of the problems of Hashverosh that we need to learn within ourselves is that we don't control anything, that it is all delusional. Any sort of attempt for us to feel on our behalf that we control something in our lives, it's delusional, it creates more strength in our ego system, and it takes us out from being close to HaKadosh Baruch because whenever we put ourselves in the picture, Hashem says, okay, you're there, oh, so you're, you're handling it, fine, 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 I'll step away. 
and that's where we become now subject to the laws of nature and happen, happen chance per se. In other words, everything is even more concealed for us. Even though Hashem is still running the show, it's concealed through the acts of nature and we distance ourselves that much more. So that's one of the things that we can learn from this delusional um, persona called Ahashverosh. Um, and what do we learn from Mordechai? One of the things we learn from Mordechai, Mordechai is the true tzaddik. He's called Ish HaYehudi. What is a Yehudi? A Yehudi knows who Modeh. He confesses. He knows his place. He's humbled enough to say, okay, this is me and this is you, Hashem. This is me and this is you. I'm just here to do, be an Eved Neeman Shalamelech. I'm just here to be a loyal servant to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's an Ish Yehudi. So the idea, what does a leader do, such as Mordechai, the, the true leader of, 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 of the times? Us, if we want to be a Mordechai in our lives, if we want to be true leaders within ourselves and for our surroundings, then we have to get ourselves and our others around us, we have to inspire them to do Hashem's will out of our own free will and not from a place of force, from a place of anger. I can't get my kids to do what I need them to do by yelling at them and threatening them and, and God forbid, cursing at them or, or acting so harshly to them that they're going to comply, but not out of their free will. How are they going to act when I step out of the door? That's how you test loyalty. That's why Hashem gives us free will. Hashem gives us free will because He knows if we're going to know that He's there, of course we're going to do what He wants us to do, what He, what we, what he, wants, us, what he wants us to do, the, to, to go according to His will. But the bottom line is, when do you test the loyalty of your employees? When you're not there. When you put that hidden camera, then you could see who's really loyal, right? Not when you're there hovering over them. So the idea is, that's the key part of a, of a leader. Am I doing Hashem's will because I'm scared? Because I'm threatened? Because I'm, I'm, I have to? Because the neighbors, what are they going to say? I have to be truthful myself. Am I, am I acting the way that I'm acting because of peer pressure? For good or for bad? Uh, if I want to be a true leader, I have to know that I have to to act out of my own free will because I know that Hashem has done so much for me and Hashem has put me in the world to give me that freedom to be able to, to use my free will in order to, to do His will but not because I'm forced to, not because I anticipate the reward, not because of any sort of bribery but I'm doing Hashem's will because I know that that's why I'm here in this world and I know that it's for the better good for me because I, all in all, whatever Hashem asks me to do, it's only for my own good. It's because the manufacturer knows how the product needs to be taken care of. If, if, if a manufacturer, you know, we bring a, you know, with a computer in the house and, and it comes with, with instructions, don't use Windex on, you know, to clean it or whatever. The manufacturer knows how you have to respond to that product, how it needs to be upkept. Hashem gave us Torah, He says, listen, I brought you into this world, here's your manual, and you have to take care of yourself in such and such a way. I manufactured you, I know what you're supposed to do, I know how it has to be taken care of. If you want it to you know, serve you well for the, for, for, uh, you know, for the time that you bought it, so it has the, the ex you have extended warranty with it. So the idea is, is that we have to know that we're doing Hashem's will because it serves our better good. That's the uh, Mordechai in us, that we, we understand our unique purpose and that we have, you know, not losing sight of that. And, and um, very interesting, you know, we all know of the, a lot of us at least know of the uh, correlation between the words in Bereshit, Hamin Ha'etz. And, and the correlation, Anyone, everyone know about this, right? Haman, okay, so Hamin Ha'etz, when, in Bereshit, when, when Adam Rishon partook from the, from the Etzadat, um, then Hashem responded to Adam and said, Hamin Ha'etz Hazeh, in other words, did you eat from this tree? Now, very interestingly enough, so we, it's written in all the Midrashim that there's obviously a connection between Hamin Ha'etz and Haman. And, and to, to they, you know, there's a lot of commentary on it and what's the connection. How is Haman connected to the snake and, and so on and so forth. So we'll get, we, I want to get into this a little bit. 
The fact of the matter is Adam Arishan was put into the world and he was given the entire world at his feet. He was able to do and enjoy physically, spiritually, on every level, every part of the universe was to his disposal besides one tree. And what did he want? That one tree. He was enticed to run after that physical pleasure of going beyond what he was told would be pleasurable and allowed for him. And he went after that one tree. And that's the Hamin Ha'etz. That's the snake. That's the Haman. That's the Amalek. That's the enticement, the temptations, the, oh, it's okay for you to do, uh, you know, to wear this, even though it's not, okay, it may not be the most Sanua, but it, it's okay. You know, it's the enticement of trying to, you know, ex to accept the rules of Hashem but to go a little bit beyond and take control and seize control and say, you know what? It wouldn't be so bad if I just did this. And th that, was, that, was the, the, um, that was the mindset of Adam Arishan. He put himself and he said, you know what? Yes, of course. He was analyzing it in a different way so that he can assume control over the fact that he wasn't able to eat from the tree and, and, and Hashem had told him no, that he wasn't allowed to. So that's the Haman in us. That's that void that we have within us saying to us, if I only had this, then I would have it all. That's the Haman in us, constantly trying to entice us to feel that we have this void that needs to be fulfilled and that we can control that situation, that if we really allowed ourselves to have that, if we, you know, if I did have that night out and I did allow myself to sort of go a little bit off and to allow myself to, I don't know, listen to this music or to watch this program or that little that little spurred moment of my own, I'm trying to control that situation, I would actually end up being a better Evid of, of, of Hashem. It's that sense of control that we're trying through our own intellect to be able to seize control and, 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 and maintain a certain part of us that, that we know is not in, in, uh, in sync with what Hashem wants, but still trying to seize that little bit of control. It's that void that we choose to fill in our own way that's not correct. So that's the, that's the man, that's the, the, ma, the haman who tried us to enjoy, tried to get us to enjoy the party. Come on, you don't have to be so different. You don't have to be so unique. Enjoy the party, be with us. Okay, you have your rules. We'll give you the kosher food. We'll give you the kosher wine. Enjoy the party. Oh, well, that's the void. You know what? That, that would fill my void. I can keep Hashem's laws. I can keep Hashem's Torah. But in the scheme of all the world, fit in within all the world. That's the mina etz. That's the tree. That's the tree that we say that if I only partake in the tree, then everything will be perfect. Then my whole life will be just in, in perfect alignment. But that's not for us to decide. If Hashem gave us, again, the rules and regulations, and this is where we're going back to the humility, if I can be in that place and say, you know what, Hashem knows best. I just don't know everything. Hashem said to me that Yichud is not good for me, if, that I'm in, a, in an office, you know, a man and a woman are together in an office and I should, you know, talk to him directly. If this is what Chazal is teaching me and he, they're giving me these boundaries that I'm not supposed to cross over, who am I, who am I to say I can control this situation? It's really not so bad if I call uh, Mr. Morgenstein by the name of Moshe. It's okay if I, you know, first name basis. The man is 70 years old. I mean, come on. We're not going to have any kirva. I'm not going to feel any closeness to the man. He's 70. He's married. He's happily married. I'm happily married. No, Chazal gave me the gderot. They gave me fences. They told me not to cross these fences. Who am I to maintain that control and say, it's not relevant to me. That's me taking, partaking of the min ha'etz. It's me taking in my own knowledge and saying, I can control this situation. That's not correct. That's, that's inviting the ego to step part, and that's where I'm distancing myself from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's where humility takes the back seat, and my ego takes the front, and arrogance, and, and pride, and saying, you know what, Hashem? 
I, I can handle this for now. Yeah, it's okay. I, I get your rules. I respect you. But this situation, I'm, I'm in control of it. Because that's, that's, that's where that comes in. So we have to be very weary of, the, of the, you know, these, these hidden Hamans that we have uh, constantly trying to entice us and, and you know, uh, give us this feeling like we can control you know, that the, the certain situations of our lives. Um, what did Mordechai do? Where does Mordechai's strength and greatness come in? So it's written in the, in the Midrash that, has, that Mordechai nursed Esther. So a nurse in the Torah language is called an Oman. It's, by the way, the word Oman is also used in reference to Moshe, that he was also, he, he referred himself as being an Oman, as nursing the Jewish nation. Oman is from the word of Emunah. It has the same root words, Aleph, Mem, Nun. So when Mordechai was saying that he nursed, who was an, he was an Oman to Esther Malka, who didn't have a mother, who didn't have a father, and he nursed her, what basically the Midrash is teaching us, that he taught her Amuna. He taught her Amuna. Now what is teaching Amuna? How do you teach a person Amuna? So the best way to teach a person Amuna, let's say you want to teach someone who doesn't have a mother, who doesn't have a father, who's a Baal Tshuva, for instance, who a Baal Tshuva, you know, or a Gior, you know, uh, a Ger, a Ger Tzedek, doesn't have a mother and a father. How do you teach them the basics of Amuna? Teach them their greatness. Teach them the potential of greatness that they hold within, their godly spark, their infinite connection to their tafgid in life. If they get to know their potential in life, if they understand that they're here in this world for a purpose, that they're connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then they're already going to have Emunah. That's going to be their first stop their first step into the, to the world of Imuna. So that's what Mordechai HaTzadik did. He taught Esther HaMalka to have Imuna in herself, to understand that even though she had no mother and no father, she held a great, tremendous tafgid in this world. She didn't know what it was. He didn't know what it was, but he taught her, you have a mission in life. You're connected to greatness. There's a reason why you're here in this world. And one day Hashem is going to show you what that reason is. And when you, you know, I'm just preparing the background. I'm leading you to that point where you're going to be able to prepare yourself for that moment of greatness. And that when that moment of greatness came and he saw that she's being called into the palace, he understood, ah, oh, this is what I've been training her all along to see. This is that moment of greatness. This is that potential that I was feeding into her, I was nursing her all those years to see and to prepare herself for that moment where she would be in that palace and she would be there as an aide, as the savior, quote unquote, the, 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 that person who would bring the Yeshua to Am Yisrael. So if you want to be able to, to fill that void in someone in your life, to your child, to your, uh, you know, your spouse, to your neighbor, you want to help someone, it's teaching them, showing them their greatness, explaining to them that they're here for a reason. Because the worst thing a person can feel, and we said this I think in the last year, is tying happiness. What is happiness? Happiness is directly connected to the fact that I am here for a purpose, that I am here for a reason. I'm not just here to inhabit space. I'm not just here to, to, to take in food and to grow bigger and to my body to be, you know, food for the worms after 120. There's a reason why I'm here. And if I can stay in touch with that purpose, if I can see that greatness inside of me, then I have a Muna, I'm directly connected to Kaddish Baruch Hu, and I have self-esteem, and I can fulfill my purpose in that much greater um, leaps and bound, bounds, because I realize I'm here for a reason. I, I know I have something to do, and so I'm not going to let life wear and tear me down. I'm moving forward. I understand, okay, that's just part of the plan. Okay, push aside. I'm moving forward with the bigger plan. And that's what, that was the greatness in, in uh, Mordechai Tzadik, Bezlat Hashem. So if I can uh, reveal within myself who I really am, then what I'm doing is, what's said about this time of our exile right now, is Anuchi Haster Astir Et Panai. We are now in an exile with a double concealment. Haster Astir. 
I will conceal my hiddenness. That's what Hashem is telling us. We're in a time now in our exile where Hashem is concealing his concealment. In other words, we have to now not just go through one layer of concealment, we have to go through a double layer of concealment. So one of those concealments is discovering myself. If I could break the barrier and understand who my greatness is, and I could discover me, if I can reveal myself to myself, if I can understand who I am and why I am here, I'm already breaking through that first barrier of concealment. Now I could discover my entry, that's my entryway to discover HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So that's why it's vital within ourselves, within the realm of us going through this shalom bayit, shalom within, shalom without, shalom bayit, ma, I'm the bayit, Who, who's the woman? The woman is the bayit. You know, it used to be then that the husband used to relate to his wife as the bayit. That was, that's how he called his wife, my bayit. We, the shalom bayit means I, if I'm shalom within myself, if I have shalom within myself, I have shalom bayit also on the outside. So if I can discover who I am, if I can, through these series of Shalom Within and Without, I can really be honest with myself and see who I am, assume responsibility for myself, then I can already break through that barrier of concealment and discover HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because if I can be forgiving of myself, if I can look at my life not through angry eyes, not through resented, resent, eyes of resentment, of bitterness, of anger towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Shalom, that he put me in this situation. Why am I here? Why am I deserving to have a child who's acting like this? Why do I have to have a spouse who doesn't appreciate me? Why do I have to look and search for my, the money for my next meal. Why? 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 All these questions. If I can break that barrier and say, no, 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 Hashem, I know I have a bigger tafkid in this world. My bigger tafkid is to work through these circumstances, to work through these challenges. Because if you put me here right now not knowing where my next meal is coming from, if you put me here right now where every year I have to move to another apartment because I'm renting and I don't have that sense of security. If you put me here in that situation, it's from here. It's from here that my greatness, that's where my greatness lies. It's right here where my Muna buttons are pu pu uh, pushed. And it's here where I'm going to discover myself and I'm going to discover you. That's what this is all about, is letting go of that feeling of, how can I serve Hashem from this place? It's so much easier. Of course, it's so much easier to serve Hashem in, in, the, in, you know, in a place where I have you know, my money for my meal and I have a husband who's going to clean those dishes so that when I come home from the shore, I don't have to see a pile of dishes. Or you know, my kids went to bed exactly at 7.30 so I can make it out of the house on time. No, Hashem says, no, I want to challenge you so I, I could see your loyalty. If you're going to stick with me in spite of the heart, times. That's when marriages are, are, are uh, really tested. When are your marriages tested? Not when everything's wonderful. The marriages are tested when, you know, your husband's going through a tough time where he really, really needs you in spite of the fact that you don't even know where you're going to find that strength from. That's where your challenge, that's where your greatness lies. That's what Hashem is telling us. That's where your greatness lies. And if that's there for you to reveal it to yourself, I know who you are. I made you. I know you're great. I know you're wonderful. I know that you're, you have infinite potential. But you have to see that in you. And you're going to see that in you when you overcome those challenges. When you go to bed at night, what a grand feeling that is. Going to bed at night and saying, wow, I didn't lose it with my kid today. Even though past times I always did. That was wonderful. You know what? I really gave my husband the time of day. How hard was it for me to, to, to nourish him and to nurture him and to give him love and attention and everything. And I didn't even know where I was going to find the strength from. And I did. What a great feeling that is. How empowering that is. I just had someone write to me today. Just today. And she said to me, she said, you know what? I don't know where this came from. I don't know if it came from your shoe or not. And I, I recognized that Baruch Hashem, I think I was the right shlichat to have sent her the message. So I was, I was today, I was just not feeling, I wasn't feeling well. I was just about to lose it. I was ready to lose it with my kids. That's it. I was fuming. And I just walked out of the room. I closed the door. And I sat on the chair. And I said, Hashem, you put me here. You put me in this situation. 
you, you have to step in here. You have to help me. I, I just can't, I can't deal with this. I'm losing it. I'm about to fall apart. That's what I always say. My, I don't know why I speak Tashem in Hebrew. I don't know. I guess I relate to HaKadosh Baruch better in Hebrew. But my words are always, Hashem, 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 tachzik oti, chazak, 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 chazak. I say, I say, Hashem, hold me, hold me. Tight, 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 tight. No, 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 not tight. And I actually squeeze my body together, feeling Hashem's embrace whenever I feel I'm going to lose it. That's how I talk to Hashem. And she said to me, I sat, she wrote me, I sat in the room for a few moments and I actually, it was, she said it was one of the most empowering experiences I ever had. I walked out of that room and I was in full control of, over my responses. And it, it was, it's bringing Hashem with infinite power. I see, it's not saying I can control the situation. I can take hold of this. I can't do anything without you, Hashem. I'm hopeless. I'm helpless and I'm hopeless without you. I'm wonderful and grand as long as I'm connected to you. That's the humility. Humility is not saying I'm a nothing. It's I'm a nothing without you, but I'm in everything with you. That's, the, that's what it's all about. It's, it's bringing Hashem at those moments of weaknesses and saying, Hashem, I'm not going to make it through the day if you don't come in here and help me. I'm never going to make it. It's not going to happen, Hashem. Step up to the plate and be here with me right now. Right now I need your help because I am going to fall apart and I'm going to lose it and I want the strength from you because I don't have any more strength anymore. What happens if you still feel like as it failed that test, so then you're going to feel... Well, that what is failing? Okay, what is failing? Still, I don't know, you still lose it with your kids, so then you're going to feel that Hashem wasn't with you. That you, like, didn't deserve Him to help you through that? Or okay, so hold on. So there, there's, there's a big gap here to say, what does it mean failing? Does it mean, okay, I yelled at my kids, but did I yell at them for five minutes straight or four and a half minutes straight? And I always say, compliment... Can, can you triumph in that moment? A hundred percent. I always say, if I usually go crazy over something and I yell for 10 minutes, I'm angry for one whole day, but this time I was angry for half a day, or I was angry for three quarters of a day, or 90% 90, 90, 90 of the day, that's progress. Mm -hmm. I give myself a pat. I, I say, thank you, Hashem. You saved me. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on a journey. I have... I have a 30-mile walk right now, but I took the first step. It's okay. You know, we don't give ourselves enough credit. And then what happens? If I don't give myself credit, that's exactly what happens. I say, oh, Hashem, you didn't answer me. Then I get angry, and I don't try next time. Right? Rabbi Natan writes, the foremost disciple of Rabbi Nachman, he says, wherever your prayers are not answered, it's either because you did not pray hard enough or you didn't pray at all. That's the only reason why you didn't see progress. But, but, but there's no, if you're asking for something, L'Shem Shemaim, that's why whenever I ask for something, I always tie it into Hashem. Hashem, give me Parnassah so I can be par Mepharnas you. So I could be Mepharnas you because if I'm sitting with Yeshuva Dat, if I have a little bit more Yeshuva Dat, if I don't have to be so concerned and I have headaches because I'm worried and I know it has to do with my lack of Amuna, but I can't help it. I'm human and you know how you, you created me, Hashem. So if you could, if you could just give me a little bit of a, of a push, if you could just give me a little bit of a pirza, a little bit of an opening and a needle, a needle hole worth of an opening, if I could just see your Yeshua coming through, then I'll be able to serve you better. I always throw it back to Hashem as if what is going to be your benefit from this Hashem? If I don't yell at my kids, if I'm more besimcha Hashem, if you can just help me dance every day, put on the music and dance, then what am I showing my kids Hashem? I'm showing my kids Hashem that being in Yiddishkeit is wonderful. It's fabulous. It's great. My kids are going to say, oh, I want to have a house. Just You know what a great compliment it is? When my son comes to me and says to me, I want to have the same house as you and Abba have, such simcha, such emuna, such connection with a Kaddish Baruch Hu. can we ask for, but, but he's not going to ask that from me if I don't show that I'm really for simcha. How can I, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in a business here, okay? I'm selling emuna to myself and to my spouse and my kids and all those around me. How can I sell emuna to myself and all those around me if I'm not for simcha? What kind of a package deal is my kids going to want to take with, with their, it's for their home if they're not seeing true simcha and emunah in the house? Right? 
So I'm here first, so what did I say? I have to change myself. The idea is for me to change me. If I don't change me, nobody's gonna change in my house. Nobody's gonna wanna buy into my life. Nobody's gonna wanna buy into the stock of my, my business, of my life. No one's gonna, gonna wanna invest in my stock of my life if I'm not showing them that I'm besimcha and I'm happy with my Yiddishkeit. I'm sorry, you wanted to ask? No, I was gonna say that statement that you made by Rabbi Nelson is very strong that a person doesn't, if they haven't gotten any shoes because they haven't great enough or at all. Over and over again, he repeats in all the books. For yourself, I mean, you could, low uh, if there's someone who's sick in the family, I'm sure that the family is praying with, with a lot of couples. And how do we, and they don't always get a Yeshua. Yeah, right. Wait a minute, if he lit, if that person lived one second more than what he was supposed to, he got answered, excuse, we don't know. How do we know how much that person was scheduled to live? Okay, so the Yeshua, how do you define Yeshua? We don't. We don't. We, we don't define Yeshua. Yeshua means Hashem, whatever I have is my Yeshua. It's the best thing for me. My Yeshua is right now in my difficulties. There's, there's a Yeshua. As I said before, it could have and should have been worse. We have to understand something. Whatever place I'm in right now, it's the best, best, best place there could ever be. It could have and it should have been worse. It isn't because Hashem ha loves me and Hashem already sent me the Yeshua. But a grander Yeshua may be, may be in store for me so I have to continue to daven for it. But I, I don't know. That's the truth. I don't know. When we say, oh, how many daven and how much, and then that person passed away. Do we know what happened to those? Do we understand the tefillahs that person is taking with them to Shemaim? Do we understand? We prayed for that person's soul. We didn't pray for that person's body. That soul continues to live after 120. That person's soul still takes the tefillahs with them. You understand what I'm saying? We're looking at it through very constricted eyes. That's where the humility comes. I don't see the grand picture. I don't know. I don't know. Only thing I know for sure is that Hashem loves me. And Hashem is doing everything exactly perfect for, for my best. That I know. That's the only knowledge that I could say I 100% know. Well, whether you pray or not. No, but praying, I'm required. Okay, if I get something, okay, I have food on my table, but I didn't pray for it. Chazal teach us that that person got the food as if he was an animal. He got, in other words, he got it like Hashem gives animals food. You mean say a bracha on it or No, 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 no. No, I didn't ask Hashem to provide me with the money that I need, for instance, to buy, to have my needs met. I didn't, I didn't, ask, for, I didn't ask it from Hashem. Hashem gave it to me anyway. So he gave it to me as if I was an animal. I, he just gave it to me. But when I dive into Hashem and he gives it to me, I make the connection. The whole purpose of tefillah is to, is to, to open our awareness is to open our awareness by understanding that we're dependent on Hashem. I daven to put myself in that place to remind myself how dependent I am on Hashem. That's why I daven. So for me to say, but I daven and I daven, Hashem's not answering me. Hello, the idea of davening is not so Hashem answers you. The idea of davening is to convince myself that He's in charge and that He's doing everything for the best. That's the only reason why I'm davening. I'm not here to change Hashem's mind. He doesn't need me to convince him to do something differently. That's not, the, the idea is for me to change myself. And hopefully by changing myself, I've shifted myself and the xeras are no longer valid for that person because I'm not here anymore. I'm here now. So there's a new set of xeras. That's where the change comes. It's not because I convinced Hashem anything. It's I changed. And so the xeras changed. And with that came rachamim and so on and so forth. You ran. No, I was just going to say when my father was sick and, and he was in a nursing home with Parkinson's and dementia, you know, of course in the beginning we got him for foolish language, but at some point, you know, when it, it got very painful, and obviously, like, logically, he was not going to have a foolish language. I just, we just thought him for Yeshua, whatever that meant. Right. We didn't thought him that he should die and it should be, he should be peaceful. Right. But just whatever the redemption was going to be, you know, we just, right. and he did, Rokish, I mean, I guess Rokish, he did pass away a month ago, but... Um, right. But right. It's true. Like that's what we we do. That's why I always say the best davening that we could do, the the most ideal um, mode of davening that we could do, is to daven for Amuna. Help me accept. 
Yeah. Help me accept. Help me see the good. Like I said, accept, accept with love, accept with joy. Wow, if I can dance in the, in, in, in the face of adversity, if I can dance when my mortgage statement, you know, came and showed me that I'm a year behind on my more, you know, if I can dance, say, Hashem, it's all wonderful. It's exactly what you want. You took away my money, but you gave me my kids' health and my health and and look, Barachamim, they still didn't close, they didn't foreclose my house. I still have the house, even though I didn't pay for a whole year. Is that not Rachamim? You know, that's the whole idea of the 40-day gratitude, you know, that we're, we're in, in, in the midst of, is to see the better good of everything, is to live with that, that, that sense of, wow, there is a lot of good. There's a lot of wonderfulness. It's, again, it's being in that humble place and saying this is good. Somehow or another, this is great. This is good. In fact, this is so good that Chazal tell us, that when we get after 120, Olam Abba, we're going to say to Hashem, why didn't you give me more Yisurim? Why didn't you give me more? That's what you gave me if I only knew. If I only knew the place that you prepared for me. If I had a little bit more Yisurim, five more minutes Yisurim, I would have been on that rank. That would have been my palace right there with all the chandeliers and the glitter and glory. Yet we don't understand. The one thing, again, is to humble ourselves to understand, Hashem, you love me, it's all good. Oh, just over and over and over again, to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. He'emanti ki adaber. Talk to yourself. Speak divrei emunah to yourself, to your spouse, to your kids. All day long I'm speaking emunah to my kids, explaining to them why this was good. Hashem has a better plan. My seven-year-old is already telling me, oh my, I know if we have a house with a garden, it's exactly what Hashem wants. If we don't have a house with a garden, that means it's not, we're not supposed to have it yet. My seven-year-old, speak it, talk it, live it. So where does the, the you know, in terms of tefillah, where is this comment you're talking about? You know, going to I went Nachman. totally off of no, there. Right. Talking about Rav Nachman and going to to the cover on Friday night and doing the whole tell him and then your bakash is answered. So why should your bakash be answered? Maybe it's not good for you to have it. But so you're saying like you have this guarantee? I'll tell you why. So I'll tell you why. Okay, so now we're already going into something very different because we're talking about the power of tzaddikim. And the power not only of tzaddikim, when I light a candle, which is one of the reasons why on the daily dose I write down, I try to always um, bring up the tzaddikim yeretzites. This is very, very important to connect to the tzaddik on his yeretzite. But here, we're talking about something else. Uh, first of all, why is it important to connect to a tzaddik on, on the Yeretzite? Because you invoke his chuyot, and you ask him to be your, your representative up in Shemaim for your bakasha. We say, I have no chuyot. That's, that's the, whole, the whole idea is for us to approach Hashem and say, Lama klum. I'm undeserving of everything. Everything you give to me, Hashem, is all of rachamim. It's all matnat chinam. It, they're all... They're undeserving gifts. Everything you give to me in my life, the fact that I'm alive, it's all, I'm, I'm not deserving of it. So I bring in, uh, from, I bring in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's elite, you know, team called the Tzaddikim, who dedicated their lives through tremendous self-sacrifice, who have elevated themselves beyond compare to where I can or where I have done. And I ask them to represent me in Rachamei Shemayim. Now, when I go and I light a candle, hopefully the idea is, is I light the candle and I feel humbled in my place when I think about the tzaddik that I'm lighting a candle for. I realize, who am I? Look at this. Look at this tzaddik. Look at the books he read. Look at the self-sacrifice. Look at the Havat Yisrael. Look at the mitzvahs. Look at the, look at the godlut. Look at the, 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 the humility. We're the madrega of this tzaddik that I'm lighting a candle. So what did I say? What am I doing now? I've shifted myself. Now I'm in a different, different place. In essence, what I'm doing, hopefully, when I'm lighting a candle, and I'm going to get to where when I'm actually physically at the kever, but when I'm lighting a candle, hopefully I'm at that place where I've done tshuva. I'm humbled in my place, and I realize, ooh, look where I am. I've got a long way to go before I can even think about standing in a place like the tzaddik to ask for something in front of kisah kavod. So hopefully I've done a little bit of tshuva. And from that place, I've given myself schuyot, and I can have the merit, quote unquote, a bigger merit, quote unquote, to ask for a bakasha for my request to be answered. 
Hold on, wait a minute. Of course not. We get to the kever. God willing, whoever's coming with me to Uman, we're getting to the kever Thursday night. We get there at 2 in the morning. Wait, when are you going? God willing, in March, uh, tw yeah. March 20th. We go there. We land at 11 o'clock at night. By the time we get to Uman, it's 2 in the morning. And I'm telling you, we are totally pumped up. Pumped up to, to just stand there in front of the kever and just to daven to Kaddish Baruch Hu. You, just, you don't sleep. I'm telling you, it's five days of not sleeping. Nobody expects to sleep, okay? I'm telling you now. You prep, you prep. Now, the three things that Rabbi Nachman says when you get to him, three things you need to do to prepare yourself to meet the tzaddik. First of all, you go there, you put money in the tzedakah, you do vidui, you do confession like it's if Yom Kippur, and you do the tikkun aklali, the general, uh, the, the ten psukim that he, he uh, told us, uh, have, it's the general remedy and it has, uh, it's very powerful. And from Thursday night or Friday or morning, up until Erev Shabbos, that's almost, whatever, 20 hours or so, we're doing Hafash al and we're doing Amunah learning, and we're doing davening, and we're doing Tehillim, and we're doing workshops, and we're doing... By the time Friday night comes, I am way up there. I am not that person that landed 20 hours before that in, in Uman. So that's, that's the Avoda. That's the Avoda. Now, when I'm... So that's part of the answer. When I go to the Kever... First of all, there's an inyan that when you go to the kever of a tzaddik, they say that part of their, one of their levels of their neshama is actually hovering around the, the kever, which is one of the reasons why they say when you go to a kever, always put your head on, on, the, uh, tz, on the tziun. Always put your head on the monument because you, you get to absorb that aura, that da'at, the da'at, the, the emuna that the tzaddik had you're being enveloped with it. One, so one of the first things that happens whenever we go to any tzaddik, any of the tzaddikim, the kotel, of course, any of the tzaddikim, when we go and visit the kvarim, the idea is for us to be motivated to do tshuva. I'm standing there, first of all, I'm standing in a place where I know someone's buried there. So that already in itself humbles me, right? And I'm doing tshuva, and I'm, I, I recognize my smallness in the, in the stature of greatness of the tzaddik that I'm, that I'm standing in front of, right? So that is all part of the idea of going and visiting Kivrei Tzaddikim. There's a lot of other things, but I'm just, on a nutshell, that's part of the process. Yeah, so connecting ourselves to the tzaddik. So in the schut of the tzaddik, that I did tshuva because the tzaddik is here and he encouraged me through his imuna and through his kedusha, he encouraged me and motivated me to do tshuva I give him the right to be a representative for me up in Shemaim and ask that my bakasha be granted and be answered for the good. I always say, for the good, right? Because I don't know if it's good for me to marry this one or to have more money or whatever. It may, it may, it may be very horrible for me to have money enough for me to close every month my bills. It may not be good for me. Maybe I might be encouraged no matter how much I think it won't affect my guy, but maybe it will. Maybe I'm going to be a totally different person if I know I have money in the bank than if I don't. Maybe I just won't be able to maintain my amuna. Whatever the reason is, Hashem has his cheshbonot. I'm small, he's big, I understand he knows better than me. Right? So that's... So, um, I know we've drifted off. Okay, so this is anyway part one because part two will be next week, uh, God willing, anyway. Okay, uh, so, so we connected to Adam Arishon. I, I drifted off. Um, tefillot. So tefillot um, connects us to Kaddish Baruch Hu and causes us also to yearn. One of the reasons why Esther Malka was so great and so big and so holy was because she sat for all those years in the palace of Hashverosh with everything going on and she constantly was embedded and embraced with tefillahs. She was constantly reaching out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's what grounded her. That's what helped her to see Hashem clearly. That was her gadlut. She had such self-control, and that only came from her connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. For nine years, she didn't tell anybody her identity. 
for nine years. We read the story and we think, oh, she was brought in and then she was there. And we read the Megillah and it was, it's as if it happened all in one day. It was nine years she sat in that palace before this whole thing came about. Nine years. You know what? Nine years self-control. Everyone's nudging her. Where are you from, Esther? Where are you from, Esther? Where are you from, Esther? She's not telling anybody. Because she understood and she knew. And that's part of Imuna. And that's part of patience. She knew that when the time comes and I have to reveal my identity, I'll know when it's right. Hashem will somehow be able to tell me when the time is right. Imuna is also very, very... Um, uh, deeply connected with patience. If we would just have patience to know that one day we're going to understand why we're going through what we're going through. One day the true identity is going to be revealed to us like it was revealed to, to Esther Makai where she had to reveal her, her identity. It's all <coughs> connected to understand that we have to have patience. But again, this world is so fast, so quick, so everything that we just are seeped into it. We're, we're being sucked into that whole mode of quick, 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 fast, 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 that we expect to know right now. And that's also gaiva, that's me being wanting to be in control. How horrible it is, really. I mean, when you think about it, when God forbid a person, law lane or law afachad, you're in a situation where the doctor says that there's a cyst somewhere and they don't know what it is and until you find out that that place of unknowing it's a very it's a big place of vulnerability but but again it's understanding just like I know one day I'm gonna find out what that cyst really is one day I'm gonna know exactly what this cyst of my life that hardship that 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 ball in my throat that I keep feeling like I want to cry because things are so difficult one day I'm gonna understand why it was there why I'm going through what, I, what I'm going through is it okay to cry though while you're going through the process? Okay, Thanks. so we've spoken about this, but I'll repeat no, it. Yeah, no, not at all. No, not at all. It's Mishamayim. Okay, so crying, uh, there's two types of tears. Um, it, one is tears uh, coming from a broken heart, and one are tears coming from complaint and whining and fetching. So the, the tears that come from complaining are tears that distance us from Hakadish Baruch Hu, and they're tears that um, cause our books to be opened and reviewed and causes more harsh judgments to be, God forbid, showered on us. So those are tears that we do not, because Hashem is always in the right. Let's, let, let's be clear about it. Hashem doesn't do anything wrong. So if I'm sitting there and I'm complaining to Hashem, I'm suffering, uh, you know, and it's hard for me, and I can't, saying words like even I can't take it anymore means that Hashem, you're giving me too much, means I'm complaining in a way. Again, it's all just sort of giving off that mode. Then the prosecuting angels come and say, look, Mrs. So-and-so is crying. Hashem, what's going on here? Let's, because there's always justice going on in the world. There's always court cases going on in the world, which is one of the reasons why, by the way, nobody ever do this. Do we know that? Nobody should ever sit down and do this. You should do this. You could do this. Don't ever. Because this means that they're doing a bed dean in Shemaim on us. We go through 24 court cases every day. Well, every single one of us gets judged 24 times a day. Okay? This is one of those times. So we don't want to... We don't want to be all of your fingers. All of them. You do not want to... Because that's how the judges sit in a court case. They're, they're, your thumbs aren't linked. No, you don't want to. You don't want to put. You don't want to interlock. Like interlock means closing your muzzle. You're closing your muzzle. You don't want that. So you, like this. I, and and it's funny. They say when you feel yourself constantly doing this, it means that they're judging you, and you should just try to break away from that. Open up your muzzle. So you don't want to close yourself up. So that's. You're always going to be 24, so it's going to happen throughout the day. You don't want to close the muzzle. This is a Kabbalistic insight. Don't ask. I'm not guru guru. I don't know all the. Is that right? I'm just telling you what I learned, and it's very. It's not. Like not you're, ca you're interlocking within yourself. You're closing out your muzzle. That's what I was told. To don't, huh? Oh, you don't show us what how to do it. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. No, no. I'm just doing. So why did I say that? Uh, oh, so tears. So, so, so there, there. So we're being judged. And so Hashem, they're opening up the books and they say, oh, you know, she's crying now. What's going on here? So they start opening up the books and they see, okay, well, let's see what she did. Let's see what you did, Hashem. And they want to know if justice was served. Hashem always is in the right with us. Like I said. Whenever they open our books, we don't want them to open up our books, because whenever they open up their books, they always see 
oh, wait a minute, wait. I know you promised that you were going to do this, but you promised her that you're going to do this if she fills, fulfills all your, your will, right? But she didn't do the whole will. Look at that bracha she mumbled. Look at that time she didn't do asher yatsar. Look at the time she didn't dress bitzniyas. Look at the time she, you know, didn't act with the muna. I mean, there's, we're, we're, we're always, Hashem is always judging us, baracha mim. We don't want our books opened at all. So when we cry and whine, we bring upon ourselves, we invoke upon ourselves judgment because they open up the books because we cause them to open up the books because we're complaining. And Hashem doesn't like it when anyone complains, okay? So try not to cry, try not to think, try not to say for sure any words of, I can't, I, this is too hard, why me, how can it be, I don't understand all kinds of words of, that depict that sort of state of mind. Yet, the cries of a shvoi lev, which is written in the Tehillim, karov Hashem shvoi lev, all those that are broken-hearted, Hashem is very close to. What does it mean, broken-hearted? I'm crying Hashem because my heart is broken. Why is my heart broken? Because I'm confused, because I'm lost, because I'm in exile, because you're not with me, because I don't sense your closeness. Because I feel so distant from you. I have no clarity of mind. I have no idea why I'm going through this. Come into my life, Hashem. Show me what this is all about. I need you. You're my light. You're my compass. You are my map. You're my guide, guidance, uh, my tour guide in this world. I'm a wreck without you. Heal me. I'm broken. Hashem loves that tefillah. That's the tefillah. That's, those tears are not only in, encouraged, but they're craved for, so to speak, by Hashem. He loves that tefillah. That's the most exalted state of tefillah that you can give to yourself and to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I'm lost without you, Hashem. I need you in my life. I don't know what I've, wh wh where have I been till now? I've been wandering. I'm the wandering Jew. I have no place. Bring me back to where I need to go. <coughs> I'm sorry. When you say all those things, I mean, isn't it true? I mean, coming to my life, I mean, Hashem is there. If, if we're not feeling it, isn't it something that we're not, that we're not saying? I mean, yeah. You, so it's not that Hashem is not there. He's there. He's so close to us, we just, it's us that's really not Right, aware. so I want to break those barriers so that I created, those veils. <laughs> but look, the, the barrier is there because, not just because of me. The barrier is there because of the whole world, because of the whole state of the world, because of the place we are in history. It's not just because of me, although of course I create my own barrier, but in general, Haster Astil, this is part of the, the time frame where we're in, the end of days. Haster Astil, it's just part of the game plan so we can work on our Muna. That's why the only tikkun of, our, of all of us is, is working on our Muna. That's, that's why we're here. That's why everything is connected to Muna. If I could see Hashem, that's my, my, my medicine, that's my balm on my, on my wound, that's it. See Hashem, purpose, ah, I got it. It's okay, I can handle it, there's a reason. So I say that and I'm breaking through those barriers because I'm saying, Hashem, why, why, is, why is it written that Hashem is hiding? What does it mean the whole purpose, hiding? It's not Hashem, you're not here. I'm saying Hashem, you're hiding, which means you're here, I just don't see you. So I am now looking to find you. I'm asking, you, I'm asking Hashem, by me just saying, where are you Hashem? That means I'm acknowledging that he's here. I'm already breaking through those barriers. So that's the purpose of it. Again, it's just for me. Of course he's here. Of course he's here. But it's for me. So I can reawaken my consciousness. And this is where I'm going to end because it's getting late. It's, uh, it's written uh, at one point, Haman uh, refers to us as Yeshno Am Echad. Yeshno Am Echad. We are one nation, right? Take the word Yeshno. And the commentaries say it's Yashnu. There's one nation that's Yashnu. They're sleeping. We're all comatose. We're all sleeping. We're together and we're all sleeping. This is where we got, we're going to end where we began. We're all asleep, which is why Hashem has to send up the wake up calls, which is why Haman comes in. Hash Haman comes in to wake us up from our comatose state. Because we eat from etzadat, and we're confused, and we're in darkness, and we are here pursuing our own physical pleasures, and we're here to, to have fun, enjoy the party, be part of a chashverosh's party. Kosher food, 
we're, ha we're all kosher, right? We have we buy black kosher meat. We all have, but we're all still having a party here. We're all still trying to fit into the Gentiles. We're all trying to adapt ourselves to the nation. Someone just yesterday sent me an article saying that the anti-Semitism is the worst today than it has been since World War II. Why? And he asked me, he said to me, why? And I wrote him very simply, look back in history. Look back in history whenever we try to become like everyone else. The fashion comes like everyone else. I mean, I hate to say it, but this whole new fashion of us wearing a short sleeve shirt on top of a, a skin tight, tight shirt, that's the fashion of the world. We should not be wearing stuff like that. All, all kinds of things. We don't realize how badly seeped we are into the, gen, the Gentile Goyesha culture. We don't even realize it. And so Hashem sends us anti-Semitism and He says, you are not them. Sorry. Don't you get it? You're not like them. I know there are certainly general cultural things. Why is that specific uh, dress considered cultural? Meaning, like, I understand, you know, V-neck or you know, an open neck or sorry, anything what? tight. Anything tight. So tight, I understand. Tight. That's a new Yeah, but I'm saying even a shirt over a shirt or a vest, you know. Most of the times, the shirts over the shirts that we see are tight over tight. And it's it's it, it is it's a it's a tight over tight. It's trying to fit in. It's trying to be hippie. It's fashionable. Sneas doesn't have fashion. It, we, there, there's no fashion to Sneas. There's no fashion to Sneas. It's covering ourselves up because I don't have to show my body off. I'm not a piece no, of meat. But then where do we get the same? You look like a bas Torah. I don't have to show my bas Torah look to anybody else. To, to my husband. I don't have. I have to be aesthetically clean, no stains, dress with with uh, iron clothes. I have to be aesthetically clean. Everything has to match. I'm not going to wear purple and orange. You know, I, I have to look decent, but I don't have to be in anyone's face. The, what is the idea of tzni? Right. The tzni The whole idea of tzniyas is for me not to be bolding out. I'm. I'm not supposed to be out in. in any, no one's supposed to know I'm there. Sneas is, nobody knows I'm there. But if you see some of the Hasidic women of that, uh, the Bhagavad I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about it. I don't want to talk about anyone. I know. I don't want to talk about it. I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm, ta I'm talking about Hashem's Torah and what He wants from us. I'm not talking about any sector and what they do. And there's a lot of machlokat. Some say that wearing a long skirt is uh, street-like and it's not acceptable. Some say Bezyak. Aselach Arav. A se a a Make a rav. Some people don't eat Kiryat Yoel, some people don't eat OU, some people only eat Mahfud, some people eat um Aida Haridit. A Salah Harav. That's my pro that's my advocate. Hashem, I asked my Rav. I checked out my Rav before. I didn't just go to any Rav. I mean, my Rav has Yerat Shemaim, I, someone I, emu I want to emulate, it's my mentor, it's someone I look up to, I would love to be on his level. If he's not above me, then he's, he can't be my Rav. I have to, he has to be above me. So if he's above me and he's telling me, this is what you should be eating, this is how you should be dressing, and so on and so forth, I'm, I'm in the clear. That's, that's where the confusion dissipates, and that's also humbling. You know why it's so hard for us to make ourselves a Rav? Because that means, again, I'm allowing someone to dictate my life. I have to be humble enough to say, I just don't know what's good for me. I don't know what clothing is acceptable for me. I don't. I'm going to ask the Rav. I'm all the time telling my husband, why don't you ask the Rav? And he's like, stop, wait, wait, wait five minutes. You want to ask the Rav? Yes, I want to ask the Rav. I want to make sure that I'm looking at this objectively, not subjectively, that I'm really seeing things correctly. I don't know. I, they say, we are the worst... Um, uh, how can I say it? We bribe ourselves. We bribe ourselves. So we judge things based on the way we bribe ourselves. If I really want something, if I love this shirt, it's gorgeous, the color, oh, it's gorgeous. I know turquoise looks great on me. I'm going to find some sort of pirza, some sort of uh, uh, excuse, a hole in the, in the halacha that allows me to wear that shirt. I'm bribing myself. 
That's why I don't rely on my da'at. I, I don't have da'at. I don't have my own opinion. My opinion is what the media is telling me. It's what I want my friend to tell me when she sees me that I look gorgeous and my hat is, wow, that color looks gorgeous. That, that's, I'm bribing myself. That's not, that's not what Hashem wants from us. We have to do and be right in the eyes of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. But we said before, the Shechina or the Shechina? The Shechina or the Shechina, the neighbor? Who is more important to us? Right? Is there a source for that though? Like uh, the general... Uh, the, I'm saying because you could find a different Rabbi will tell you... You, you go to G'dolei Adol. Go to G'dolei Adol. Right. Go, to, go to Rav Kanievsky's, um, you know, uh, instructions on what Tzniah's clothing are. No lycra, no cotton, nothing sticking to your body, nothing that outlines, you know, your, your body. Everything is wider than, you know, your body. It's not me. No cotton because it sticks. Cotton sticks. You mean a t-shirt, not a Yeah, yeah, I'm not talking about under. I'm talking about wearing, like if you wear... No, 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 that's, no, 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 right, no, but it's... You mean like a t-shirt. I'm talking about a t-shirt, yes, that's what I meant, yes, sorry. You know, the collarbone. We, we know all that. I, the reason why I'm talking about Tzniyas is because... I